Good morning, friends. I hope you're doing well today, and uh, something's changed. I'm downstairs. I'm not doing this in the upstairs hiding from the kids, because this room right here was where the kids did most of their schooling for that two weeks that they were stuck here at home. So they're back at school, and we are able to meet here without them. It's quiet in our house. We're getting work done. It's amazing. Welcome. And so I'm excited to do this devotion with you as we continue our journey through Haggai. Now, uh, one thing to think about, we had a great time with the kids at home. Really, we did. It was fun, and part of me just loves having them at home. Um, and when they go back to school, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, you guys have to go. But I just, I enjoy them. And in fact, for that whole COVID thing, as exhausting as it was, it was just a deep pleasure to have them with us and to spend that much concentrated family time. Um, but there's something that comes with it, a problem that comes with them being at home, and that is it's a lot harder to get things done. There's kind of this sense of I'm going to work on this here, but then these little interruptions come and they come in and they, they, they wear you down. And by the end of it, you're tired and you don't know why because you haven't got as much done as you would have liked to. And it's just simply what happens when you have kids that want to share their lives and their days and their plans and their questions and their problems and their technical problems with you. Now, I think of this and it's kind of like our story from Haggai. It's that sense, remember in Haggai, Haggai the prophet was speaking to Zerubbabel, the governor of Jerusalem, after the exile, and he was telling him and the people why it just seemed like they were exhausted, why it seemed like they were, they were working hard but they weren't making any headway, why they were planting but not sowing, why it seemed like every dollar that they got ran through their pockets so quickly. He says it's because you haven't built the temple yet. You haven't given to me what is mine. And so you find a lack in what is yours. Kind of like when you've got kids at home and everything that you're doing, there's this tension between them and you. Uh, there's that old saying that man cannot serve, uh, what is it? Uh, man cannot serve by two masters. Um, he either uh, hates the one and loves the other, or he loves the one and hates the other. Something like that. Jesus said it. He said it better than I did. All that to say, um, the, the whole idea there was God and mammon, God and the God of money. And there's a similar tension there um, when you've got the kids at home. Your, your attention is divided. And then the beautiful thing happens when you are able to simplify your focus, to focus on that which you need to focus on. Everything shifts. And that's where we're going to go to today. So we're going to start in verse 12 of Haggai chapter 1. And we're going to read a fair chunk. And it's all narrative, which means I don't have to explain too much. But I invite you to join me for this story as we see what happens when the people of Jerusalem put their priorities where they belong. Ooh, I've got a pillow here. I could just lie back. I won't do that. Here we go. Haggai 1.12 then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheathel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, a high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheathel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehodazak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehodazak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How did you see it now? Is it not as nothing with your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehodazak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus the Lord says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more in a little while, 
I will shake the heavens and the earth and the seas and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So here we go. Let's just summarize what happened there. So Haggai spoke the first words that we heard last time we met. Those words spurred the people of Jerusalem, um, particularly Zerubbabel and uh, Joseph, son of Jehodazak, um, into action. And they and the people went to the, to, to the temple and they worked on it. It says what day they began work. It doesn't say what day they ended work. But you have this image now of them working to build this temple. And then in the midst of that, there's this sense of a lack. A sense that though they've, they're building this beautiful temple, it's not going to be as beautiful as it was. They're just a small time province now. They're not a nation. There's no King Solomon uh, building it. There's not the wealth of nations being brought into it as it was then. Um, they are relatively limited in what gold and silver and precious stones they can use. They're even limited in the kind of stones. They're not carving great marble columns as it is in other places. This temple, as you can see them building it, and as it comes to a practical reality before their faces with the limitations of their hands, you get this sense that, oh my. Anyways, we get that sense because God's words to them are words of hope in spite of that. He says, look, I am here with you. That's what you really wanted, right? You want God with you. And he says, look, I am here with you, so be strong. Trust in me. And then he goes on to say, I am the one who uh, have made a covenant with you when I, was in, when I brought you out of Egypt. Now I brought you out again. You're mine. You're with me. And I will shake the nations. And I will bring treasures from the nations to rebuild this temple. Now, this is where things get interesting. He goes on to say, I shall fill this house with glory. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace. So once again, it's an interesting thing. When it comes to prophecies, there's these levels, kind of like an onion, layers. So the first layer is, of course, the practical reading. God is saying, you've built this building and you've built it with your hands. My spirit's with you. Don't worry. Just like it was when they built the tabernacle in the wilderness. But, you know, it's not Solomon's temple. That's okay. My spirit is with you. And don't worry because this, the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the previous houses. Now, the first layer of that is this sense that God is here with them and God's going to make this house as beautiful as Solomon's temple. Now, we know that's not going to happen. It was built and it was rebuilt and it was made beautiful and Herod's temple was supposed to be amazing but neither or none of them surpass the glory of Solomon's temple. So that reading, the first reading, the, the initial reading, you kind of go, eh, that doesn't really, how does that work? But then we get to the, the story of Christ in the midst of it, and this is about Christ, isn't it? And so now if we take the meaning of the church and we see the church is the temple, which is something that we've talked about in sermons and talked about in other places, you, Christian, are part of the living temple of God, living stones built together by the Holy Spirit knitting us together into one body for the purpose of glorifying him and bringing glory to him from around the world. And now everything starts to sing. He says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory. Now, the current moderator of the PCA, um, Erwin Entz, uh, takes passages like that particularly that one and some passages like it in Isaiah. And he says, that's not talking about gold and silver. That's talking about the peoples. The treasures of the nations are the peoples of the nations. And he is saying, uh, he goes from this passage in Isaiah where he describes the nations as uh, beautiful gemstones in the, in the crown of the Lord. In the crown. And he goes on to say, we are that beautiful nation. So he's um, Haggai here is looking to a future temple that is coming, the church, and he's looking to the glory of what it will look like when all the nations are represented as part of this beautiful, dynamic kingdom of God. Uh, with all of our different you know, ways of worshiping, with all of our different clothes, with all of our different skin tones, with all of our different languages, 
all of them, we proclaim the glory of God. And this is the beautiful temple which God shakes the heavens and the earth to bring forth. And, and, that, and it's true. All silver and all gold is his. Everything is his and he can accomplish with it. And the ultimate glory of this house is that. The glory of the temple in which we participate in, which Haggai is speaking of, is a glory greater than Solomon's temple. It is a glory where the Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us. And through us, we proclaim his glory and show his glory to the world around us. That's beautiful. And the most beautiful part of it is that last verse. In this place, God says, I will give peace. That's our calling. That is the calling card of the church. Peace. You wouldn't believe it sometimes, but that's the calling card of the church, is to declare peace and to bring peace. Um, in the book of James, he says that the church, we are to be um, peacemakers, and that that's the blessing that we bring to the world. The, the, um, so all of that is, that's the image right here of the temple that we are a part of. So I hope you see this, you see and you remember two things. One, the priority, the, keep our priorities straight. Do first things first. Give first to God. Live first for God. Um, make our priorities first for his kingdom uh, so that we don't find that dripping away and everything dripping away with it. And second things, trust him and be part of his kingdom and his temple. Don't get caught up in our earthly expectations of how he's going to build his temple. But just walk with him, trusting him, living for the kingdom of God that's coming. And so I'm going to close this actually with the Lord's Prayer because it kind of leads us right into that understanding of God's kingdom. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Live for his temple and his kingdom this day. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye.